All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is David Shear. I'm representing Mendeley Data today. I'm joined by uh, my fellow colleagues from our metadata subcommittee through our um, Gray Initiative project. And today we're here to give you a Gray collaborative webinar on our uh, work regarding metadata and getting community feedback. So we're, we're pleased to have you here today. We have a lot of things we'd like to discuss with you, things we'd like to share. And uh, most importantly, we'd like to get your feedback. We have a jam-packed agenda for today's discussion and presentation. Uh, so to start things off, we wanted to give you an introduction to our J, uh, Gray repository initiative, who our repositories are, and what are our objectives. Uh, for those of you that are, are new to learning more about Gray, we'd like to give you just a brief overview We'll also talk a bit about our collaboration model. We like to call it our competition model. And then from there, we'll talk about our uh, metadata recommendations and how these recommendations relate to the use cases that we've established as part of the Gray Initiative. We will also talk about how our recommendations align to the data site metadata schema, which we'll also talk about the partnership that we have with, with data sites as part of this overall initiative. We do have some interactive sections as well. So we have a few poll questions that we'd like to ask you as our, our attendees. Uh, we have three questions, so we'll take time from the presentation to pause, move to our, uh, our polling period, and then move back to discussing our implementations of the metadata schemas and how it aligns to our use cases. And we actually have a couple of our general repositories that have started the process of implementing some changes to the metadata schemas and their repositories to align to the recommendations. So we'll hear from two examples from OSF and Dryad and how they're progressing with the recommendations. We'll then talk about what's next for the initiative as far as the further implementation of the recommendations for metadata, how it aligns to our use cases. And we'll also talk about how you can further participate and provide community feedback um, to, uh, to the participants here today. So I'm gonna start now and just give you a brief overview about our Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative or GRAY. So GRAY is actually a NIH funded project and it was designed to make it easier uh, to find and reuse NIH funded data. Uh, the initiative is intended uh, to supplement the domain specific repositories that are available for data deposits. And these are critical components uh, of the NIH biomedical data ecosystem for data sharing. The initiative builds on the findings from the 2019-2020 NIH FigShare pilot and the NIH workshop on the role of general repositories to enhance data discovery and reuse. The initiative includes seven established general repositories uh, with a mission to establish a common set of capabilities, services, metrics, and social infrastructure raise general awareness and facilitate the education and training of the FAIR principles and the importance of data sharing and, and more. The initiative also aims to improve discoverability of data within and across the participating journal repositories and to lead to greater reproducibility and reuse of data. The gray repositories are represented by the names that you see here, which includes Dataverse, OSF, FigShare, Dryad, Mendeley Data, Vivli, and Zenodo. And you'll actually hear from many of the presenters today that represent our various general repositories. Lastly, along with our general repositories, the initiative also includes DataSite. Uh, the gray repositories register DOIs uh, and associate their metadata through the DataSite schema. Uh, with DataSite, a global community is focused on ensuring research outputs and resources are openly available and connected so that their reuse can advance knowledge. Through alignment with data sites metadata schema and the gray repositories register their consistent metadata, enabling connectivity of data sets with other digital objects such as articles, researchers, research or organizations, grants, and funders. The long-term vision of Gray is to develop a collaborative approach for data management and sharing 
through inclusion of the general repositories in the NIH data ecosystem. Gray also aims to better enable search and discovery of the NIH funded data uh, within the general repositories. With this in mind, the initiative is built around 10 primary objectives, uh, which includes supporting the discovery of NIH funded data, adopting consistent metadata models, facilitating quality assurance and control, connecting digital objects, cataloging use cases supported by the initiative's goals and outcomes, implementing open metrics and preparing training materials, and also conducting outreach and engagement. Lastly, one of our main objectives also is to commit to a unique collaboration model in place with our general repositories, uh, serving as a partnership to support the GRAY objectives. Uh, this unique engagement model is what we refer to as our competition model. So I'm now actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Anna, who's going to go into more detail on this model. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, so I'm Anna Van Gulick. I'm at the data repository Figshare, where I'm our government and funder lead. Uh, and I have the privilege of this year being one of the co-chairs for the Gray Co-Opetition, or the collaboration amongst these seven uh, different generalist repositories with NIH. Um, so I want to present to you the Co-Opetition model and why it's particularly relevant here to um, having common metadata across the generalist repositories. So uh, co-opetition um, is a portmanteau of cooperation and competition. Um, and uh, it came uh, from that 2020 workshop on generalist repositories for, for NIH data sharing. Um, actually it predates that as well from a book uh, some of you may be familiar with on game theory. But um, the idea here is that these, um, all of these different repositories can work together and we can cooperate on uh, common features and standards. So having this idea of a value line. Uh, so below that value line, we want to do things the same. We want them to be interoperable across our platforms and across the data ecosystem. Actually, even beyond generalist repositories would be ideal um, for the entire data ecosystem to adopt interoperable standards. Um, so things like metadata um, as one of these, as well as persistent identifiers, common metrics, which is another objective of Gray, uh, things that support discovery um, or other important features. Um, but then there's also unique features of each of these repositories, which we can continue to um, compete on in a friendly manner. Uh, next slide, please. So this gray commitment to cooperation is pretty central to the uh, gray program and makes it fairly unique. Uh, and David outlined the seven different generalist repositories and data sites that are that are participating in gray. Uh, and these repositories are definitely all similar. They all support fair data sharing across disciplines, generalist by nature, flexible um, for sharing many different types of research outputs. They strive to adhere to the NIH repository of best practices. And uh, most of us already use um, community standards like fair, uh, using data site metadata and adopting persistent identifiers like, like ORCID and ROAR. But it's also important to note that these there are differences among these repositories. And prior to Gray, we didn't always work together on building our products. Um, so the benefit of Gray is that we are coming together to do that. Um, there's a mix of nonprofit and for-profit companies, repositories that are built fully uh, open source versus having uh, proprietary infrastructures. And we also offer varying features. Uh, some of us offer different visualizations, accept different file types, offer different licenses, different curation workflows, uh, controlled access, uh, things like that. Next slide, please. And so the Gray Co-Opetition is designed to be a collaboration amongst these generalist repositories that allows us to jointly advance our repository functionalities to better support NIH data sharing, discovery, and reuse. And so this co-opetition allows for us to have a cohesive and interoperable generalist repository landscape um, including getting to work together and communicate on a regular basis, uh, and importantly, to come together to implement the same common best practices and standards, uh, including, very importantly, leveraging those existing community standards. And you'll hear a lot today about the data site uh, metadata schema and how we are uh, adopting common 
parts of that all together. So rather than starting from scratch, we're leveraging those existing standards as well as for persistent identifiers. And all of this will help support um, greater uh, flexible data sharing, enhanced data discovery uh, and tracking of its impact uh, and allow us to have uh, unified partnerships. Um, but of course, still keep that individual uh, functionality as we need to uh, as well. So this is a, a really unique opportunity. And I think metadata is one of the best examples uh, for how the co-petition model can benefit generalist repositories and the data landscape more broadly. And I'll hand it over to our next speaker. I think back to you, David. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> so that we've explained a little bit about what Gray is and uh, our competition model. We want to let you know where can you find more information and as well as documentation about uh, the Gray initiative. So looking through some of our project materials. So we've actually deposited all of our project materials uh, into Zenodo, which you can actually find via our Gray community, which is a one-stop shop for all of our Gray materials. Uh, it's very easy to find. You can actually go to zenodo.org and from the homepage, click on communities in the upper menu bar. From there, you can actually click on the communities page and enter generalist repository ecosystem initiative and search for the gray community. From there, you'll be able to see our materials, um, see what's going on within the gray community. You can browse our recent uploads or search for specific uh, keywords or files. And one of the great things is actually leading to our conversation today, this is where you'll be able to find our um, metadata recommendations in relation to the use cases. So I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Julian, who's now going to introduce you to our recommendations. Hi, thanks, Dave. Um, my name is Julian. I'm uh, along with Dave. I'm a, a co-chair of the metadata subcommittee. Um, I work on Dataverse and on Harvard Dataverse as a as a user experience researcher, and I'm going to be going over like an, an overview of the metadata recommendations and how they relate to the use cases. Um, so you can see uh, on the left, uh, like uh, the first page of the recommendations, which is as Dave said, are are in Zenodo right now in that great community, um, and the DOI is over there. Uh, next slide, please. Now. Can everyone still hear me? Hello? Yep, Julian, I apologize. This is uh, oh my my technical issue. I apologize. Oh. All right, I thought I lost my so my Wi-Fi was on the fritz. There you are. Great. Yeah, so um we saw this chart already, uh, and I wanted to show it again, just as a nice way to show how you know, um, uh, the what the metadata recommendations mostly relate to, uh, which is the objective for adopting consistent metadata models. And uh, because the goals of connecting digital objects and of implementing open metrics rely on, on metadata, we've kept those objectives in mind as we were working on the recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we discussed what kind of information each repository should collect and distribute in order to support those uh, great objectives and the goals of the metric subcommittee, which is another subcommittee that's that was working specifically on uh, open metrics. And we also, uh, like I said, looked uh, through, uh, you know, tried to consider the, the following four use cases from the use cases subcommittee. Um, so next, the next slide, I'll go through um, each of those use cases uh, really quickly because um, they really they really drove our work. We wanted to make sure that you know what we were considering, we were talking about had uh, you know we, we kept in mind who the users were, um, and that included uh, NIH funded researchers who needed to select a repository to share their data so that they could comply with uh, data management and sharing plans and the conditions of their grants. 
um, we wanted to consider the use case of a researcher who uh, wants to find research data of interest so that they can validate findings, reuse data, and build on work within their discipline. We wanted to consider folks from institutions, like academic institutions, who who need to report on uh, uh, you know research outputs like data sets from from their institutions so that they can ensure compliance or research data sharing and management plan commitments by their researchers. And uh, fourth, uh, we wanted to consider the use case of a funder who, uh, from a specific NIH institute or in general, uh, who needs to find data sets that they funded so that they, they can uh, also report on compliance with their policies and, and track impact of, of the research, uh, their funding and the usage of that data. Uh, so the next slide. Um, we'll see uh, just one of those use cases. And, um, you know, when we think about uh, how, or, you know, a funder might want to find data sets they fund it, what kind of information might a system need, um, like a repository or a portal or a search engine. Um, and, and, and so uh, we saw that repositories need to collect information about who funded the research that produced the data set, right? And then in the next slide, there's another piece of that use case um, for tracking the impact of research funding and usage of the data. So repositories need to collect information about other research objects that cited and used the data. Um, and uh, what's not here, but I, I, I forgot to mention is, you know, and, and, re and systems need a way to get that information from repositories. Um, about you know the the data that's being deposited in there and how it relates to other research objects like uh, journal articles and and um, computational workflows and even software. So on the next slide, um, we'll talk about uh, uh, why we chose the data side metadata schema, which which Anna already uh, already said, which is that we're all already. Uh, uh, sending and uh, collecting and sending the kinds of metadata that, that data site needs when we're registering DOIs for, for research objects like data sets. Um, the data site metadata schema is also nice because it's domain agnostic. And, you know, these seven repositories uh, um, are working with different types of disciplines and um, and data site already collaborates closely with Gray. Um, so that was also nice. They're a collaborate, collaborator of, of, of the Gray initiative. Um, so we have their ear, they, you know, and, and their expertise about the metadata schema, about their future plans. We, we've talked about um, things that they're uh, reviewing for, uh, you know, adjustments to the schema in, in the future. And uh, finally, uh, other resources, other services rely on the Metadata Express and Data Site Schema, including metadata aggregators and data sites own event data service, which is is uh, is what's being used to um, you know track uh, the impact of of data sets, citations, and 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 uh, you know views and downloads and those kinds of things. Um, so next slide, please. So the, the great metadata grade recommendations highlight specific properties from the data site metadata schema in, in the current version beyond just the minimum fields that you need to, you know, that uh, you need to get a DOI. And repositories are encouraged to incorporate these properties into their metadata or identify a, a local equivalent field. So for example, an author identifier field can be mapped. Uh, to the data site name identifier sub property of creators. So basically, you know, what, what people type in or select or somehow the repository records an author identifier, that information is is included in, in, the, in the metadata that's sent to data site. Um, when registering a DOI with data site, recommended properties should be included in the data site DOI metadata. Um, next slide, please. So we want to get more specific about uh, one of these use cases and how we we are, we uh, use the data site schema and particularly parts of it to um, to support the use cases. So here we have you know a, a, a funder from an, a specific NIH institute or a general needs to find data sets they funded. Um, 
and that that image is showing a, a bit of the uh, a data site schema um, and and fields that relate to uh, funding information and how repositories should send information about who funded the research that produced the data that was deposited. Um, and then in the next slide, uh, we'll also see um, a bit of metadata that's important for tracking the impact of research funding and the usage of data. Like, uh, you know, so identifiers specifically that uh, are associated with other objects that are related to the data set, data set like, a, like a journal article. And I forget if this is my last slide. It is, yeah. So I'll hand it back to um, the whoever will be doing the poll questions. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. So yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we're going to take a pause now from the presentation, and we have a couple of poll questions that we're going to ask of you to, to please participate. And we're going to run the questions one by one. So the very first question you'll see up here uh, available to you is, have you shared data in a repository or assisted others to share their data in a repository? Uh, if you could just put quickly an answer to that question and then we'll uh, be able to share the results and we'll move on to the next set of questions. We're about 70% done. So please, if you haven't yet, please take a moment just to look at the poll question and please put down a response. We would appreciate it. Thank you. few still that are looking at the question. If you haven't answered yet, please do so. The first poll question here is, have you shared data in a repository or assisted others to share their data in a repository? And we'd like to simply just know yes or no. All right, I think we're out there. So we, we have an overwhelming majority that have shared, so we can um, show those results. Uh, so you should be able to see those now. So 81% of those that have answered have said, yes, um, they have either shared repository data in a repository or they have assisted others to share the data. So uh, thank you again for answering that first poll question. We'll now move on to poll question number two. Poll question number two is, if you have shared or assisted others to share their data in a repository, were the metadata requirements clear? And for this one, there are three options. You can say yes, no, or not available. So quickly just take a look at that question and, and please select the most appropriate answer for you. We're more than halfway done with those that have been answered. So thank you for those that haven't answered yet. Uh, please just take a look and answer your um, with your with your best answer. Okay, we'll give it another minute or so. We're about seventy five percent. So we appreciate those that have answered. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and we'll just go ahead and, and share the results so far. So it's um, still a majority um, that have said yes, but we do have a fair number that have said no, um, which is great. We appreciate knowing that. And I think hopefully with our recommendations, this will assist in that matter. Um, so thank you very much. We'll now move on to poll question number three. So poll question number three is, if you have searched for or assisted others to search for data in a repository, have you found the metadata useful for discovery or context about the data methods or conclusions? And with this poll question, there are three options. You can say yes, no, or not available.
give it a couple more seconds here. Thank you all very much. And this is the last poll question. So we do appreciate your, your participation um, in the poll during the webinar. Thank you very much. All right, we are at 75%. So I think we can go ahead and share the results for this one. Um, please feel free to keep answering if you haven't yet. Um, but again, with this question, if you have searched for or assisted others to search for data in a repository, have you found the metadata useful for discovery or context of data methods or conclusions? And we do have a majority that have said yes, uh, but we do see uh, a large percentage that have said no or not applicable. So we do appreciate you uh, sharing your, your thoughts and your experiences. Thank you very much. So with now with this, I'm gonna turn the, to our next slide. Uh, over to Gretchen to talk about the experiences of the implementation and use cases with OSF. Great, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Gretchen Giggin. I work at the Center for Open Science and we operate the Open Science Framework, which is a, also more commonly known as OSF. Um, and OSF is actually a platform for diverse research outputs. We're a little different than some of the other repositories in that we do serve repository functions like um, storing data. Uh, but we also have collaborative uh, spaces. We do registrations of research activities, um, and we run some preprint servers. So um, it's a really diverse uh, platform with three main kind of elements. And all three of those services uh, were designed and implemented individually and at different times. So the metadata that was developed and, and stored for each of these um, separate kind of objects um, was a little bit different. Um, so slightly different, but significant overlap in each of them. So um, as part of the work on this, um, on this project, once the metadata work, uh, the metadata working group had become to begun to kind of zero in on the data site schema as a common core to work from, um, we went back and analyzed metadata across all of our objects uh, to identify overlap as well as areas that we could enhance with new properties that we weren't already capturing. So um, in the color-coded spreadsheet here, you can see um, in the first column that uh, in some cases we only have one product that is using a particular property. In others, we have two or three. Um, and they kind of run the gamut of, of different uh, situations there. So if you could go to the next slide. Once we finished that analysis, we then compared it to the recommendations from the group and the data site schema. So from that, we went back and we, we developed an application profile. Um, and an application profile is a metadata model that reuses as much as possible elements from standard metadata sets. Um, and it defines how you and your repository or your organization are going to create metadata for your objects. So it's basically a sitting back and thinking and designing the kind of metadata schema or template that you're going to use. Uh, so we went back and we created a metadata application profile, um, which we call OSF map, um, to uh, represent everything in OSF. So instead of each of the different objects having kind of slightly different um, properties. Now everything shares the same set of metadata um, properties. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that we had to go back into the repository and redo everything. Um, it's really more of a mental model um, so that as we move forward and develop these things further, we can tweak and make adjustments so that everything meets the kind of recommendations or specifications in this model. Um, you can also see, um, I, it might be a bit small, but in the last column that's shown on this slide, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we can map everything that we are providing um, into data site uh, properties. So we can meet all of the recommendations and requirements for data site records. And we do actually export out data site XML uh, records in this format when we share the records in uh, with data site. Um, we have a very similar conformant JSON version that's available through our API. Um, and metadata records can actually be downloaded uh, from OSF in that meet this metadata application profile and meet these um, this metadata model. So um, 
the uh, the other columns in the spreadsheet just represent the labels and whether or not a field is required and what the requirement is for what the value is in in the um, in the property, etc. Uh, if you move to the next one, then. So the profile consisted of that table that I showed you, as well as an introduction. And there's a link there to the OSF um, project where you can find all of that if you're interested in taking a look. Um, we made it public back in. Uh, we made it. We made it public back in uh, April. Although we had actually launched some of these new metadata properties a little bit earlier in January, um, and this was a result of this process. So um, shown here is a, a metadata record for a project in OSF that has several of the new properties that we added as a part of this um, project. So the names of funders um, and the specific kind of types of material um, from the data site schema as well as language. And there were a few other um, tweaks along the way. And uh, if you go forward one more to our last slide, um, just as of last month, we have launched a new search interface for OSF. Um, and so it uses this new metadata model and these new fields. So you can see we now have facets um, for things like research, re resource type, excuse me, um, and funder, as well as um, some other things that we were already um, including in the application profile or excuse me, in the metadata, but are now done much more consistently across all OSF objects. So you can also see at the top there, um, the main search is bringing you back to everything in OSF, but you can um, then tab through and look at just our projects or just registrations, preprints or files. So this was all um, inspired and driven by uh, the, you know, recommendations to use this core um, metadata uh, schema, and it's really helped us out internally by providing consistency across the whole corpus, but is also helping us to interact and share with um, with others by adhering to that common core of data site and being able to um, share that with others. So I think that's it for me, and I am handing off to Ryan. Thanks, Gretchen. I'm Ryan Shirley uh, with Dryad. Like OSF, we went through a very similar process of reviewing our metadata model for compliance with the gray recommendations. Uh, since the data site schema is pretty central to our internal metadata, it was straightforward for us to determine how to add the recommendations into our system. And we therefore focused a little bit of our efforts on making sure that we could make the most of these new metadata fields in our user interface. So this shows a snapshot of our submission process where users are adding data and highlighting the funder field. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In accordance with the guidelines, the funder field is required unless the user doesn't have any funder, and then they must check this no funding received checkbox at the bottom. In the case of a large funder like the National Institutes of Health, we can detect that that funder has sub organizations, and then we require the user to select which NIH institute or center provided their funding. Next slide. So we can obviously display that information on our pages that describe data sets. Uh, next slide. And like OSF, we've recently added more search filtering for funders, uh, including that sort of hierarchical uh, determination when we have a funder like NIH that has subparts, you can select just NIH and see data sets that are associated with each of the institutes or centers under that organization. Next slide. And then a feature that we've recently added to really leverage all this metadata that we're collecting is a dashboard where the funders can log in and track compliance of data submission and publication associated with any of their grants. So they can narrow it down by dates, by uh, submitting institutions, and we're talking with funders about adding more specific search and browse capabilities onto this page. Uh, right now, 
one of the things that we found very useful is that we allow exporting of these results into a CSV so that the funders can process them in any way that they like. Um, of course, all of this information is stored in the data site schema. So that really uh, advances the coopetition model that we've talked about earlier, um, that when we publish funder information to data site, that goes alongside the funder information that OSF sends to data site and all the other gray repositories. And so people can use the data site APIs to search and manage this information across all of our repositories in tandem. All right, so we'll go back to David to wrap up. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> so now that we've talked to you about the gray initiative, our competition model, our uh, recommendations for the metadata, our partnership with, with DataSite, and how this is being implemented at a couple of our example repositories. What's next? So there are a couple of different things we'd like to relay to you all. First, for those of you that like to know more about uh, the gray community, please follow along and read our blog. Um, Likewise, you can, as we mentioned earlier, you can look through our, our Zenodo community to look at our resources and, and documentations. Um, and you can help us to engage with your communities uh, with these resources, uh, the presentations or communications that we've made available. One of the best things that we can do that we need at this moment is we need your feedback. Uh, we'd like you to, to please read our recommendations documentation that we showed you earlier, and we've put the link for that um, um, in the chat with the Q and A, and we'd like to get your feedback on this, and we'd like to gather this using the the form that you see here on the slide. Uh, we'll make sure the slide uh, link is also um, for the form is available in in the chat here, so you can click on that. Um, please provide us your feedback. Please let us know um, what works, what 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 gaps you may be finding, um, other other details you'd like to share with the the metadata subcommittee. Uh, we'd like to hear it. Additionally, we will have some additional webinars uh, still forthcoming this year. Um, you can join us actually for our next webinar um, in our Gray Collaborative Webinar Series, which is going to be held on Friday, October 13th, uh, regarding our uh, work on metrics. So you can actually join from the link there below, and we hope to see you at that next webinar on metrics. As we get to the end of our, our webinar today, uh, I'd like to join myself with Julian, and we'd like to thank our Metadata Search Committee members for their hard work and dedication. Um, this has been a, a, a massive project for many of us, and, and working together through this um, and working through the, um, the updates and, and um, uh, technical aspects of these recommendations with our, our repository platforms and infrastructures. So I'd just like to, to thank all of my colleagues on the subcommittee for their participation and collaboration. So thank you all very much. With that, we now have um, a few moments. We'd like to now open the floor and ask for any questions or comments that you, our attendees, may have. Um, I'll ask my colleagues that have presented maybe to, uh, to come off and um, share screen with them and then allow them to uh, participate in the, in the Q&A. Uh, so we have turned on the Q&A and I see we've already been answering questions. So we'll we'll turn to this now and see what questions are still open. If we need, can, we can answer these live. Um, and like I said, if you do have other questions or comments you'd like to share with us, please utilize the feedback form that I shared with you a moment ago. All right, so running through our questions, yes, we have shared the link to the, uh, where you can find the recommendations. Again, that's in Zenodo, and you can find the recommend uh, the recommended citation and DOI for that as well. And we can see here, there's a question here about uh, registering um, a DOI for a data set and receiving by mistake, potentially, uh, more than one DOI. Um, and be submitted to either a JOS repository or to a, uh, a domain specific repository. Um, so thereby leading to hidden redundancy and subsequent issues with proper data citations, citations and linkages. So I'm gonna see if any of my, my colleagues uh, uh, that were uh, co-presenters, if anybody would like to answer that. Uh, 
Uh, hi, this is this is Julian. I I don't have the answer, I, but I imagine this happens. I think each repository, um, you know, in their outreach and their training, um, and in their in their in their guidance uh, that they that they provide, uh, especially if if it's a self curated repository, um, they you know try to make sure that researchers you know that the data being deposited and getting a DOI is is um, is unique to that repository, so so to speak, um, and you know doesn't exist anywhere else, or if it if it does, it doesn't also have a have a DOI. Um, I will say before you know I, I give the floor to any of my other uh, colleagues that um, I'm sure data side is, is is also aware of this and they've done work to try to um, prevent this from happening, especially since they're very involved in the infrastructure for citing. Um, for tracking citations and uh, of of data sets, so they are very interested in, in deep duplication um, when they get DOIs. But uh, I'll leave it to the rest of my colleagues to share anything else. Jump in a little bit. I, I yeah, I think you're totally right, Julian. This is um, one of the goals of Gray is uh, to reduce uh, duplication, um, and part of that is through the interoperability. Uh, across the repositories that it will become more readily apparent um, with higher quality metadata, um, what data sets are where. Um, and so maybe this will be less of an issue. I think it's something we're definitely trying to address through training and outreach and best practices for data sharing for NIH funded researchers, and all researchers really. Um, it's something that I think we may get to further um, as we look at data um, QA and QC objectives that are part of Gray, um, which are a little bit downstream from having common metadata and common metrics. Uh, and then we can look to that. But you, I think through the best practices that we're um, detailing to researchers, having uh, clear linkages to related materials in your metadata and having that be a clear part of the gray metadata schema um, should help quite a lot because it makes it clear that, yes, there are related materials that, you know, maybe not even duplications, but people may use uh, different multiple repositories for the same data set or the same research projects may have different outputs that should go to different repositories, right? They may use both a discipline specific repository and a generalist repository and then have other materials in GitHub or, or elsewhere. And we want to make sure that those are all well linked and that the relationships between them and related publications are well defined. So the, the metadata quality hopefully helps with that a bit as well. Great. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Anna. I think we'll we'll look here. I see there's a there's a direct question to Dryad. Um, can anyone browse to see uh, what's been funded by a civic funder, or is it behind a login access uh, for only the funder? Yes, I was just typing an answer for that. Um, so uh, our search system is publicly available. Uh, so anybody can use the search system and filter by funder. Um, our API is also publicly available. Uh, so you can download information about data sets and access the funder information that way. Of course, you can use the data site APIs. Uh, we do have some things that are limited to particular users like the dashboard. Um, and that's largely because our dashboard allows seeing data sets that are still in progress uh, that are not fully published yet. Um, so that is a feature that we reserve for our funders. Thanks, Ryan. And I think there's also, uh, since you, you you had discussed it, I think there's also a related question here about the APIs. Um, so we uh, the question from Jonathan Moat was asked, um, is attention being paid to, to common standards for API access? Um, so, uh, you know, will the general repositories uh, provide expanded API access with this new uh, um, metadata that's being made available? Well, from my point of view, I, I I think common standards for APIs are the next big step that I would like to take. 
as far as coordinating some of our repositories, but we haven't really taken that step yet. Uh, there were, uh, I was involved in a number of initiatives to standardize APIs about 10 years ago, but many of those initiatives kind of fizzled out. And now that we have sort of new repositories that have been through a new round of, of metadata consolidation, I think we're at a place where we can start to tackle that problem again. Great, thanks, Ryan. I see another question. We've got a lot of uh, let's get several votes. Um, is regarding um, how do we build the bridge to explain the metadata concept and um, working alongside uh, researchers, uh, you know, in a non-digital setting. You know, scholars that maybe have access to power issues or or access to uh, uh, the the technical needs that they may need to share their data. Um, I think one thing we can talk about with this is that um, speaking to our co-opetition model. There's many layers of the engagement and, and the outreach that uh, all of the repositories participating in the initiative are taking place. We we have our engagement and outreach that we do um, as part of the initiative. Uh, speaking of you know this uh, this webinar is one, but the webinar series as a whole, um, the the activities that we've been doing in various um, events and uh, um, but we're trying to do more. And I think the other thing is speaking to our own individual um, use cases as well. Uh, where each repository is also taking the initiative to do their own outreach and engagement um, about the work that they're doing and its relationship to the GRAY initiative as well. Um, so this is definitely something that we we are mindful of and, and trying to spread more um, and showcasing how through our collaboration, through our competition, um, you know, this is, is focusing on the betterment of the entire ecosystem, but also how we're able to better serve each of our individual uh, sets of 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 uh, users and, and um, you know, I think the second aspect of this as far as the, the non-digital setting, I think it's also um, the foundations of, of the metadata, you know, that is making sure that researchers understand, you know, why we, we concern ourselves with metadata and, and you know, both the, the reuse metadata, the, uh, the descriptive metadata, um, and trying to figure out how we can capture that and, and when and how we can capture that then in a digital aspect. Um, you know, basically setting the foundation for that when we can. Um, uh, colleagues, anybody would like to to add anything additional to that? Okay. Uh, there's a there's a there's a question we get a lot, and I think this is also something we're trying to focus on and make uh, more available is uh, what are the similarities and differences between the gray repositories? Um, can we just pick one for my project or, you know, uh, how do we go about that? And I can briefly say we, we have tried to do this and try to kind of put up uh, some materials that will showcase this um, and talking about the various nuances of, of uses and needs and capabilities. Um, and I do believe we have some of that in the works that we will be sharing. I think there's actually a first iteration somewhere. Um, colleagues, if somebody could uh, can correct me or if you could share that potentially in the, uh, the chat, I'd appreciate that. But yes, we will have more documentation about the uh, the comparison capabilities of each of the competition partners. A few more of these questions that are coming in. Right. If any of my colleagues, if you have a question that you'd like to answer, please feel free. Okay. Um, so I see a question about um, how would what metadata requirements would we recommend to a new repository just setting themselves up? Um, so I guess I would say that this uh, common metadata schema that we're coming up with at, as for the grave repository to apply to ourselves, we hope will be useful to the to the larger landscape as well. So that's um, part of the goal of recommending this. Um, and it's something that we've actually spoken with some uh, discipline specific repositories that are funded by NIH or um, run through part of uh, NCBI and things like that, um, who are really good at their uh, discipline specific mission, having discipline specific metadata that works really well for their data types, uh, but maybe haven't implemented something like ORCID identifiers or ROAR or some of these other common practices. So um, we're hoping to actually extend this schema 
um, across the landscape and that it will be useful. So I think that's, <laughs> this is what we would give them. Um, and it will be an iterative process. So we'll keep learning um, from different uh, stakeholders. Um, we're gonna be talking about this at International Data Week, uh, SciDataCon and RDA, if you're there. And we're, we're hoping for that panel session to be quite uh, participatory with the audience and learn from the other experts in the room there. Uh, so that's another chance that we're going to keep uh, iterating and getting feedback on this work. There are there are even more questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know which. Is there another one people want to jump in yes. on? Gretchen, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So um, I actually answered this in chat, but I'll um, answer it live as well. There was a question about. Um, distinguishing between metadata basically at different levels. So we have our data site schema kind of describes data sets as a whole thing, but how do you describe, you know, the individual variables or the population sampled or things like that? So um, that's really a different uh, difference of different schema. So uh, we're recommending for kind of interchange at this macro level, um, adhering to our recommendations in the data site standards. But there are other schema out there that you can use for these more kind of granular and discipline specific um, uses. So for example, DDI is a schema that um, is used to, uh, to basically create a code book to um, describe variables and to make the um, to go alongside a, a a data set to to make it kind of understandable, and they actually have a suite of um, several different standards, so uh, you can actually track changes in in data sets across like longitudinal studies or um, different kinds of things like that. So um, certainly, you should be viewing um, you know data site schema and R schema as one that exists in a in a world of. Um, standards that can kind of suit different needs and, and work together to um, achieve different purposes. Great. Thanks, Gretchen. Ryan. So I see a question here about, is it possible to see more details about the funding? Um, in, the, For example, a link to the grant number. Um, this is something that is starting to be more discussed in the funding community. We can currently link to some funders. Um, so I know NSF and NIH both have an API and they have landing pages for grant numbers that you can direct to. Um, but even those very large funders still do not have persistent URLs for their individual grants. Um, so there is discussion among the funder community to start assigning DOIs to grants. Uh, and we are in some talks with the funders about adding those DOIs into our system. Um, so we would greatly welcome that if we can get the funding community to really uh, coordinate on that. Thanks, Ryan. I think that speaks again to please, if you can, um, you know, we'd love your participation. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, so please fill out our feedback form. If you want to get involved with the, the initiative, uh, please contact us. So with that, I'm going to now turn it to our, our very last slide. And just to say thank you um, from all of us the, on the, the metadata subcommittee, um, you know, again, myself and, and Julian as co-chairs, we thank you all for participating in this webinar today. Um, we'd like to also thank our colleagues um, from the subcommittee to, from joining us and our competition partners uh, for being a part of this overall initiative and project. Um, it's it's wonderful to see this coming together and, and having some actual things to, to share and implement. Uh, and again, as we said, we'd love to have your feedback. We'd love to see um, what uh, we can do to further improve this and, and work with our partners and with DataSite. Uh, and we'd like to see you at our next several events. So please join us in October for our next metrics webinar. Uh, and with that, we'd like to say thank you all for coming today. And uh, we will soon be able to share the recording. You'll find information about this through our Zenodo community and access to the links. Thank you all very much.